Yo, what is going on guys? Welcome back to Baloney Basketball. I'm here by myself today. Um, it's one of those episodes, you know, sometimes I just got too much stuff to get through and that's exactly what we're doing today. So really this won't be too long of an episode, but what I'm going to focus on are the six major awards and the NBA playoffs because it is playoff time. I know we did the play-in predictions on the last episode, but, you know, right now I figured, you know, let's make the official playoff predictions because not everyone counts the play-in as part of the playoffs, especially since, like, the stats don't, uh, essentially. Um, but, yeah, so I think we're going to start, though, with the award predictions, and I'm going to run through them one by one. I think I'm going to go from the least exciting to the most exciting awards um at least for the nba so starting off we'll start with coach of the year um you know it's the only thing that's given to someone who isn't an actual player so i figured let's start with that so for my coach of the year there's been a lot of great candidates this year um you know monty williams has been great for the phoenix suns has him number one right now um and you know season's over so <laughs> He finished number one uh, in the NBA and the Western Conference. You know, Taylor Jenkins has done a great job as well. Um, you know, Tyron Liu is always going to be up there. Uh, you got J.B. Bickerstaff for leading this Cavs team to where people thought they couldn't be. Eric Spolstra is always going to be a candidate. But my winner, I have Monty Williams. I think Monty Williams had a good argument to win it last year. And, you know, this year, I think, is his time. Uh, I could very well see Taylor Jenkins winning it again, or Taylor Jenkins winning it and Monty Williams losing again, uh, which would be unfortunate because a lot of people thought last year that he deserved it over Tom Thibodeau. But I think this year, it's hard to ignore the Suns and what they've been doing. I mean, they've been like a complete tier above every other team, not just in the West, but in the whole NBA. Um so I really got to give him that nod there as my coach of the year. Um, moving on to six man of the year. Uh, this is probably the most obvious of the main six awards, and I'm going to give it to Tyler Hero. Not really much competition this year uh, for that spot. I mean, maybe you could consider, um, you know, Kevin Love. He's been playing pretty good uh, for the Cavs, but he hasn't really been as, I would say, consistent as Tyler Hero has this year. Um, you know, Tyler Hero was an all-star candidate. I mean, he really wasn't going to make it. I think most people realize that. But the fact that he was even in the running um, says a lot. Maybe, I don't know, guys like Tyus Jones uh, could be up there. Um, yeah, really there's just not a whole lot of candidates uh, for the award this season. So, you know, I'm, I have no other choice but to give it to Tyler Hero. And, yeah. So moving on to most improved player, this is probably one of the most tricky ones and probably will be the most unpredictable award uh, by the end here. You know, you got DeJounte Murray has stepped up huge this year. I believe he was second in the NBA in triple doubles, um, you know, leading his team to a top 10 spot in the fight in the play in despite losing guys like, um, you know, DeMar DeRozan and Rudy Gay like in the offseason. I mean, it's huge. It's huge. Um, being a first-time All-Star as well, despite being as a like injury replacement. Guys like Jordan Poole have improved a lot. Um, you know, Tyrese Maxey is obviously up there. Um, Darius Garland, uh, you know, being an All-Star this year, I still remember, <laughs> I think, after his rookie year, someone said he was the worst player in the NBA. Like they came out with a whole article explaining the top 10 worst players in the league and he ranked number one. So it's just kind of funny to see like how far he's come as well. Uh, but my winner, believe it or not, um, now most of the awards in recent years haven't really followed this tradition uh, for most improved player, but I'm actually going to give it to Tyrese Maxey. And he was my prediction going into the year as most improved player. And I know a lot of people were like, what? That makes no sense. But even though he is a second-year player, 
because I know they don't like to give it to second-year players that much. Like, he still had a dramatic improvement, like, all across the board. He's shooting, I think, 3% better from the field. He's shooting, like, I believe 12% better from three this year. He's a much better playmaker. Obviously, he's scoring at a higher level. That's what more opportunities is going to give you. But he's really just doing everything a lot better. And to ask a guy who's, you know, that young to step into that role that quickly. I mean, last year he was getting maybe like 12 to 15 minutes every given night. He wasn't even a starter on this team. And to go from being a guy that, you know, missed several games, didn't really have much of a role on the team uh, in playoff time last year, kind of a limited role, all the way into being probably the second option for a majority of the season, I think it says a lot. And I'm going to have to give him credit here as my most improved player. Like I said, I picked him as the winner before the season for a reason that rhymed. Um, But I just think that, you know, he's nothing's kind of taken my eye away from saying, oh, someone's improved drastically more than Tyrese Maxey. So I'm going to give him my nod as most improved player. Um, the next award is the Defensive Player of the Year Award. And there's been a few candidates here. Obviously, early on, I think a lot of people thought, like, Draymond Green was going to run away with this. And then, of course, he got hurt, missed several games, and now he's not. And he might not even be, like, probably top five by the end of it. Um, You know, a lot of people are talking about Marcus Smart and Mikel Bridges recently. Those are the main two. I think every year you can count on Rudy Gobert being up there. Uh, you know, he's one defensive player of the year, I think three of the last four seasons now. So in what he does to help the Jazz always be in the mix, especially in a year like this where they've had their struggles, they've had their chemistry issues. Um, of course, he did miss some games, though, which could hurt his case. Um, and then, of course, Giannis. You know, Giannis is going to be up there as well. I think Giannis is probably – the only guy that's going to be in this discussion as well as the MVP discussion, um, at least within like maybe top five, top six range. And then, of course, Bam Adebayo is up there. Um, he missed some games as well. But if you ask me, I think the defensive player of the year has got to be Mikel Bridges. Because, I mean, looking at what Mikel Bridges has done this season – of all guys that have averaged 20 points per game or more, he's holding those guys to 36% from the field, which is the best of anybody in the NBA. Um, you know, he's been consistent. Obviously, durability is never a problem for him. He hasn't missed a game since middle school. Uh, I think the last time he missed a game of basketball in his life, Kyrie Irving wasn't even drafted yet, or Kawhi Leonard, you know. So just puts in the perspective, like, how much you can count on this guy to be there every given night. He really kind of jump-started Steph Curry, arguably his biggest cold streak of his career. Um, You know, that was kind of like the first game where he started going, you know, downward. And then obviously he picked it back up before he got hurt. But, you know, like he did that. And he, he's had like a lot of good He had a great game the other night against uh, Donovan Mitchell a few weeks ago, actually. Um, But still, like he's able to shut down some of these star players that a lot of guys can't. You know, it's almost like very Kawhi-esque. Um, so, got to give him some credit there. So, and also, like, you know, DeAndre Aiden, I know he has improved as a defender over the past few years, but I wouldn't necessarily call him a elite rim protector, per se. So, when you factor all that and then look at the Phoenix Suns, they've had one of the better defenses in the league this season. I mean... I think you got to give it to Mikel Bridges. Uh, I mean, Marcus Smart, he's been great defensively, but I feel like a lot of his campaign has been jump-started over the past like month, month and a half. Uh, maybe some recency bias in there. Uh, so, yeah, I, th- I just think i got to give it to the guy who's been doing it all year long. You know, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon at the end of the day. Um, rookie of the year, I'm, you know, there's three guys that are probably going to be in this running. Um, and if they do the award ceremony again this season, like it's pretty obvious who the big three are going to be. Um, it's going to be you know Scotty Barnes for the Raptors, uh, Evan Mobley for the Cavs, and Cade Cunningham for the Pistons. 
people thought early on, like maybe, you know, Josh Giddy would have a chance. Franz Wagner would have a chance. Um, even Chris Duarte went off early on, but I think it's really down to these three. Um, I think, you know, you look at Scotty Barnes definitely has the team argument. His team is the fifth seed in the Eastern conference and he's been pretty consistent, um, throughout the year. You look at Evan Mobley, he did miss some games, but I think he played a huge role and probably has shown some of the biggest flashes of potential, um, you could argue, of these three. But then you look at Cade Cunningham, who I have winning this award, and I think that the reason is he just simply makes everyone better on his team. And if you've if you've been watching the Detroit Pistons ever since the All-Star break, like they've looked really good. I know a lot of people usually around this time, teams that are down that low in the standings, they're just like, who cares? Like they don't want to watch them. But I mean, I've been watching the Pistons from, you know, post All-Star break until their season ended and they played pretty good for most of that time. And a big reason why is because of him. I think like in the past like two months of the season, he was averaging like something like 21, 7 and 7. Uh, he was shooting pretty solid from the field, p- pretty good from three as well. And he's obviously a great defender. So I think that, yeah, like that's only like two or three months sample size. That is the one thing that will probably hurt his case. Um, but I just think overall that he's done probably the most for his team. Um, you know, these other guys, they've kind of been in and out. Uh, Scotty Barnes has been up and down, uh, Mobley more than in and out, but I don't know. I think I would just personally put my vote for, uh, Cade Cunningham and we'll see like how this all goes. I think he'll still be the best player in this draft class, but a lot, a lot of time to tell. And then MVP. So it's kind of down to three guys at this point, mainly, you know, Nikola Jokic, Joel Embiid and Giannis so I think a lot of people are kind of between the race of Jokic and uh, Embiid as of late which is unfortunate for Giannis because it seems like the past like five or six years almost any given year he could be MVP Uh, he arguably could have been last year it could have been like in 2018 but and I know a lot of people you know are picking Jokic, he will most likely win the award. But I personally believe it's Embiid. Because, you know, it's kind of unfortunate. The way the argument is for Jokic is based on how many, how much he's missing, really. Like, Jamal Murray's been out, like, the whole season. Michael Porter Jr. missed er, all but a dozen games, really. And then, you know, the rest of his team isn't necessarily perfect. But that's kind of like not a great argument because you could say the same thing about Embiid for most of the season. You know, I don't think he really pushed necessarily for the James Harden trade. Uh, And even if he did, he's only played just over a dozen or so games with the Sixers himself. And he's actually played worse with Philadelphia than he did with Brooklyn early on. And most of the early part of the season, people were saying Durant was the MVP favorite. So now it's weird how, like, the narrative has changed. And Tyrese Maxey, even though he's had a great year, it's hard to ask a second-year guy that young to elevate from being, like, the seventh, eighth, ninth man to the second guy for most of the season. Tobias Harris has been way up and down. And other than that, the supporting cast is not great. I mean, the Nuggets with Jokic probably have a better coach as well than Doc Rivers with Philadelphia. I mean, if you guys have seen, like, what he just said about Paul Reed recently, um, I was not a fan of that. I think that's kind of weird for any coach to say. Um, But, yeah, so I personally am giving it to Joel Embiid. I think that from about, you know, especially, like, late November-ish until, like, mid-March, like, he was dominating. I think, like, just, like, kind of the first month or so of the season – and then maybe, like, near the end. But he still was dominating all the way through. It's just that, like, maybe he didn't win the key matchups, which is kind of ridiculous, I think. I don't think, like, one or two games can determine an MVP. Otherwise, don't you think everyone would have been pushing for 
LeBron to win MVP like two years ago, that weekend where they beat the Bucks with Giannis and then they beat the Clippers with Kawhi when he was it was his second year with the Lakers. I feel like everyone would have been pushing for him to be MVP, but they didn't. And especially like especially a player like LeBron. But now it's weird that they're doing it like guys like Jokic uh, and Giannis in this instance. And I can understand why Embiid's a little upset that the media maybe isn't giving him that much credit. So that's what I have for my awards. Uh, mainly themed, you know, I got two 76ers in there. Um, I got one Detroit Piston, one Miami Heat, and two Phoenix Suns. So moving on to the NBA playoff predictions. Starting off with the first round, the Phoenix Suns and the New Orleans Pelicans. In this series, I have the Suns in four. <laughs> it's not going to be that interesting. Um, you know, I don't expect Zion to come back at all. It seems like every report says he isn't going to come back. Like, it's, oh, it's like we're holding out hope. But it's it's just not going to happen. I, I, I don't think it will. Um, based on like what we've seen out of, you know, him, I mean, we even saw him like doing like windmill 360 dunks and he's still not out there. So I don't know. I just think that he's done for the season. I'm pretty sure a report even came out a week ago saying that he was, and I think people are just still hoping he will come back. So I don't think he will come back. And I think this will be a short series. Moving on to the Dallas Mavericks and the Utah Jazz, the four five. And this is tough, but I'm going to roll with the Utah Jazz. Um, they've had a very up-and-down season. Um, Luka Doncic, though, last game of the season with a calf strain. And, it you know, obviously it probably won't affect him necessarily from playing in the series, but I think it will limit him quite a bit. You know, that's not necessarily an injury that you can just come back from and play 100% at or move 100% at. Uh, I think that the Jazz will probably try their best to get Donovan Donovan Mitchell the ball and seek out Luka on that end. Um, they'll probably run a lot of, you know, if the Mavericks run zone, they'll probably try and exploit Luka necessarily. So I'm going to have to roll with the Jazz in six. I think that they probably will blow like one game or something uh, in there because that's just kind of been the story of their season. So that's why I have him still going to six. Uh, maybe Dinwiddie will go off for a game, but I think that's the safe pick right now. Moving on to the Memphis Grizzlies and the Minnesota Timberwolves. This will be a good series, a really good series. Um, you know, there's two young teams that, I mean, Memphis kind of has some experience from last year. Not a whole lot because, you know, they were just in the play-in and then kind of lost in the first round. Uh, the only game they won was when Donovan Mitchell was hurt and then he came back and they had no chance. So, I mean, it could, it could be kind of a coin flip and that's why I think it will go to seven. Um, and the Timberwolves have been great, but I just think they're too inconsistent for me to actually pick them in this series. Uh, and I think in the closeout, I think John Morant will probably show up, um, might even drop like 40 or something. Uh, but I'm going to roll with the Grizzlies in seven. Um, they've just been too good this year to, you know, pick a seven seed necessarily over them. Moving on to the Golden State Warriors and the Denver Nuggets. This is a series that I think people thought we were going to get in like 2019 uh, when they were the top two seeds in the Western Conference. And, and people thought it would be in the conference finals. Um, Denver fell short. They lost to Portland in seven. Um, that was when like... You know, CJ went off, um, you know, Dame had like a clutch steal, clutch three, and, you know, Portland won in Denver. But, you know, now we are going to see it, probably not to the same capacity as back then because, um, you know, obviously this is like pre-injury uh, Clay Thompson. This was Draymond Green probably with a little bit more athleticism. Uh, Steph Curry was fresh. Um, now he's going to be coming straight off his injury. And then as for the Nuggets, it's like you're missing Jamal Murray, you're missing Michael Porter Jr., and the landscape of the team is a lot different. You know, guys like Aaron Gordon are there now. Um, you know, really, other than 
maybe Jokic and what else, like Monte Morris, Will Barton. Like most of this team is way different from it was just three years ago. Um, and also like, you know, the status of Curry coming straight off that injury is going to be tough. But I also saw that Compazzo is suspended for the first game because he shoved Wayne Ellington uh, in a pointless game, um, you know, to close out the Lakers season. So I will probably have to go with the Warriors in six. Um, You know, I think Clay will probably do his thing. Obviously, Jordan Poole has been playing really good as of late. Steph Curry's most likely going to be back this series. If he's not back by game one, he probably will be back by game two. And, you know, even if he's just out there playing, it's hard to pick, you know, a team like the Nuggets necessarily. Jokic has to do a lot. If Jokic isn't playing well, they really don't stand much of a chance. Um, You know, the good thing, though, is that the Warriors necessarily don't have an elite center. But Kevon Looney has done a pretty good job. Um, Draymond did too. But against Jokic, like when they face this year, despite Denver going 3-1 and one against him in the season. So I got the Warriors, though, in six. The Miami Heat and the Atlanta Hawks. I think this could go six. Um, the Hawks have been an interesting matchup for the Heat. Uh, not just this year, but also like last year. So... I think they could create some mismatches. I think there will be one game where Trey just goes off. Um, And, you know, the Hawks have a lot of guys that if they're playing the way they played against uh, Charlotte, where, you know, everyone else is getting going, like Kevin Herter had it going, Gallinari had it going, Bogdanovich had it going, DeAndre Hunter had it going big time in the third quarter of that game, then it's going to be hard for the Heat, I think, to keep up. You know, the Heat don't have – quite as many perimeter threats which could be a problem um in the postseason but they're definitely going to have uh that defense and that intensity the ball movement so I think the Heat will still win in six the Sixers and the Raptors I see a lot of people saying this series will go seven and that a lot of people think that the Raptors might even win but I think the Sixers will win. Um, I just really, I think the key is how do you stop Joel Embiid? Um, And I know like Matisse Thybul isn't going to be available in uh, Toronto, at least as of now, unless, you know, things change. But I don't know. There's just, I don't see any way that anyone could stop Embiid on that team. Pretty sure the tallest guy on the roster is Chris Boucher, who's 6'9". So... (laughs) Um, you know, see, they could run like a small ball lineup, but again, they'd have to be hitting their shots. Um, and that puts a lot of pressure on guys like Gary Trent Jr. and Fred Van Vliet. And, you know, if Malachi Flynn gets, uh, some chances. So I don't know. I think that I'm going to rely on the guy who I picked as my MVP going to be an MVP finalist. Um, you know, and this is even if James Harden doesn't play great. I still feel like that the Sixers will probably get it done in not that many games. It might be a sweep, um, but I didn't want to say that necessarily. Um, you know, the Raptors have been good all year. I think that Nick Nurse will do his best to outcoach Doc Rivers because, let's face it, he probably will. <laughs> um, that's probably the most glaring edge in this series. So with that being said, like maybe it could go to seven. Um, maybe the Raptors could, you know, steal it, but... I'm going to go with the Sixers um, in five games. Moving on to the Celtics and the Nets, the 2-7. This is an interesting matchup as well because last year you had Brooklyn was the two seed, Boston was the seven seed. Now this year Boston's the two seed, Brooklyn's the seven seed. And, I mean, last year Brooklyn kind of destroyed them. I, I think Celtics won one game and it's because Tatum just went off. And then they were, you know, easy work and a gentleman's sweep. This year is a little bit different. Of course, Celtics are missing Rob Williams. But, of course, the Nets last year also had James Harden. Now they don't. And the guy they traded James Harden to get, Ben Simmons, isn't going to be available at least for the early part of the series. Um, And also, you know, Celtics will have Jalen Brown, which they didn't have last year. They got guys back like Al Horford and Daniel Tice who are pretty familiar with the Celtics system. I know it's a different coach, but 
still this is somewhere that they had you know fun playing for like when they first started there now they're back and i think they've kind of refound uh the fun things that were that they had like when playing with boston so it'll be a close series for sure this might be one of the most interesting series probably the most interesting series at least in the first round but i'm gonna go with the nets in six on this one the bucks and the bulls i see a lot of people saying sweep i see a lot of people saying bucks and five but i'm gonna say bucks in six and i'm gonna say in six because i think everyone's talking about it too much being a sweep or like just a demolition derby but I think the Bulls are going to catch the Bucks off guard in one game. You know, they're definitely hearing all the noise. And then you also got to factor in, like, every game is going to be a Bulls home game in this series. I know the Bucks, you know, their fan base has been developing over the past few years. But it's still nothing like the Bulls when the Bulls are good. So, I mean, even when they played this year, the Bulls really packed their crowd, like their stadium. So, I'm going to roll with the Bucks in six. Um, second round, we got the Suns and the Jazz. This will be a good one, actually. I mean, Devin Booker and Donovan Mitchell, this is something that we were hoping we'd see last year in the conference finals. But, you know, if we get it here in the second round, I think it would also be pretty interesting. Um, you know, the Suns, they've just been better this year that I have to pick them in six. I think this is where the Jazz, their road ends, which is unfortunate again, because Another year not making it to the conference finals ever since, like, I think 2007 when they made it with Darren Williams and Mehmet Okur and those guys. Carlos Boozer, former Bull. The Golden State Warriors and the Memphis Grizzlies. um, And I said it in that order because I believe the Warriors will win this in five. Now, don't get me wrong. I would want to see the uh, Grizzlies win. But I just feel like that experience, this gives me... Um, I guess PTSD of the Bulls Heat series in 2011 when the Bulls were the one seed and we won the first game, everything was looking good. Then the Heat came out the next four and they beat us. I think something similar will happen in this series. Grizzlies might win game one and the series might just end after that. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's hard to count out the Warriors when they're so experienced. Um, you know, they got championship pedigree. The Heat and Sixers, I'm going with the Heat and Six. Um, They've done a pretty good job against Philadelphia uh, for most of the past few years, and they probably want revenge, really, from, I think, 2018. So, I mean, we'll we'll see. I think also Jimmy Butler is going to have some extra, I guess, animosity in this series because he used to play for Philly. The Bucks and the Nets. This might be a very critical series, (laughs) Um, and... You know, last year everyone picked the Nets. I remember, like last minute, I think I picked the Bucks on my prediction. Then they went on and won it all. Now, Bucks are definitely favorited this year, but I'm rolling with the Nets. Um, as crazy as it sounds, I think that the Nets will get it done in seven games. Um, but yeah, and we'll talk about the Nets here in a sec too. Suns and Warriors Conference Finals. Give me Phoenix. Um, See, I picked the Warriors over the Grizzlies just because the Grizzlies don't have quite that level of experience as of yet. Um, Phoenix, I mean, they made the finals last year. They were in perfect position to win it all. I don't think they fear anybody, and I think that, you know, they've just been better this season than the Warriors. Um, So give me Phoenix and six. The Brooklyn Nets and the Miami Heat, the seven seed and the one seed, very interesting in the conference finals. And what's even more interesting is I'm going to pick the Nets again. I think that they're going to win this in six. Um, you know, I just think by this time, if you're letting the Nets get this this deep in the run, they're going to develop like more and more chemistry, and it's only going to become harder to stop them. I think a guy like Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving are going to have that chip on their shoulder that, you know, they're going to want to get it done. I think also by now, like Ben Simmons would be available. Um, you know, they got guys as well like – tons of veterans that are critical down the stretch of a playoff series maybe Drummond would be used Blake Griffin would be used LaMarcus Aldridge the the latter two I saw just working out the other day so they should be available I would assume and in the NBA finals we get the one seed Suns and the seven seed Nets the Phoenix Suns have been 
the best team in the NBA this year, without a doubt. And the Brooklyn Nets were the favorites coming into this season. So, very weird way to meet up in the finals at 1-7. But, as much as I would want to see their fan base win for the Phoenix Suns, I am going to have to go with the Brooklyn Nets. I I don't know if I told you guys, but I had a vision. I had a dream in the offseason where Kevin Durant... You know, he won a championship and everyone on Twitter and Instagram was, you know, had they saw the light and they turned their ways toward KD. They all gave him that respect. And then how Kyrie Irving, he grabbed the microphone and he said to everyone, I told you so. Everyone that said I was in the wrong for sitting out the first half of the season and then, you know, every home game until like literally the mayor in New York made the adjustments <laughs> at the perfect timing but I don't know I think it's it's that's the thing too everything is setting up perfectly for them to be in their peak form and nothing has proven to me since I mean they were the number one seed before Kevin Durant got hurt they were still looking like the Nets that we believe could be champions so it is tough. That would be really tough for the Suns. Um, I have this series going six, and I think Kevin Durant will be finals MVP. But it, it would be really tough um, if that's how the season ended. But like I said, I I had a, I had a dream. <laughs> it's Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. once said, I had a dream. No, but I, I really did. So I'm – and I mean, they're definitely good enough that they could win. I think the biggest challenge will be probably the Bucks. But if they can get over the Bucks, I think that, you know, at that point, people are going to start definitely having that faith in this team. Um, but, yeah, that's basically it. Um, yeah. Again, hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you guys for watching. Um, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you did enjoy. Um, and, yeah, hopefully the playoffs are pretty fire. Um, hopefully you guys don't um, have too much animosity toward me over my award predictions but if you do oh well you can tell me who you have in the comments below you can tell me who you have winning it all in the comments below but yeah thank you guys for watching hope you guys enjoyed and i'm out peace